and welcome to Dear Hank and John. Nor as I prefer to think of it, Dear John and Hank. It's a comedy podcast about death, where me and my brother John give you dubious advice, answer your questions, and bring you all the week's news to both Mars and AFC Wimbledon. I, I mixed it up just a little bit in the middle there. Did you catch it? Yeah, uh, I'm sure that that's just incredibly exciting for our listeners. How are you, Hank? I'm good. I would like a sandwich. Do you have one? Uh, I don't, and also I can't transmit sandwiches over the uh, the internet tubes. I apologize for that, but that's one of the things that the internet doesn't do well yet. It doesn't... Uh, we can 3D print things uh, across space and time, which is nice, but we cannot yet 3D print sandwiches. <laughs> At least not edible ones. No, no. And even if you even if you could, John, would you download a sandwich? Uh, yeah. No, I would. Um, I never found that to be a compelling uh, marketing campaign. There was an era where the movie studios uh, were like, you wouldn't download a pizza. Don't download movies or music. And I was like, of course I would download a pizza. No, yeah. How do, yeah. No, could, could I do that? I, th- I mean, I would download a pizza way before I would download a movie. Right, yeah. Like, in the case of a, of a movie or music, I understand that there, there are creators involved who need to be compensated. In the case of the pizza, uh, as far as I can tell, pizzas just come from space. I don't think that there are... Uh, <laughs> I think that... <laughs> they grow on pizza trees. I believe they do. They grow on pizza trees and they get picked by pizza farmers. So I guess the pizza farmer needs to make something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but... Uh, I don't know. Uh, anyway, the point is you can't download a pizza or a sandwich for that matter. Uh, I feel that we should move on to the uh, the short poem for the day. Uh, if, you, if you want to. All right. Uh, this is a poem by Claude McKay. Hank, I don't know if you're familiar with his work. One of the major poets of the Harlem Renaissance, but for some reason much less famous than uh, Langston Hughes and some of the other uh, Harlem Renaissance writers. But I, I don't know. I really like Claude McKay. This poem is called If We Must Die. Uh, and it is a, uh, a great American poem about uh, the African-American struggle for civil rights. If we must die, let it not be like hogs hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us though dead. O kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. If We Must Die by Claude McKay. Wonderful. Thanks, John. I mean, I feel like that's... That was a poem about death that wasn't that depressing, or it is depressing, but it's it's uh, there's something defiant about it that I like. Uh, I like poems that are defiant toward death and toward systemic injustice. I think that defiance is probably the right uh, the right response. Uh, so yeah, I love that poem. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. Okay, we got a question from Nikki who asks, "Dear Hank and John, last night." A few of my old friends from college and I got together for a low-key dinner party. Somehow we started to compare ourselves to characters from Saved by the Bell. I thought for sure they were going to agree that I was Screech, the nerdy awkward one. But they saw me as more of a Lisa, the fashionable cool one. Uh, Though both Screech and Lisa are fun characters, they are just about as opposite as could be on that show. You've talked before about self-identification, but what about outside perspectives? Are we more who we think we are, or are we more who others think of us? Also, do you think we ever stop questioning who we are? I have some questions for Nikki to start off. Yeah. Uh, Do you, like when your friend group forms an impromptu unexpected uh rock band do you play the bass guitar because that would Mm -hmm. be a lisa turtle thing Uh, yeah that's very lisa in fact that's a lisa yeah yeah, when when all of your friends uh spend a summer working at a resort do you instead just be a guest at that resort because of how your father is extraordinarily wealthy because that would be a lisa thing that's so lisa so Lisa, uh, so if, so maybe those are maybe you're maybe you're just not as familiar with Saved by the Bell as you think you might be. You did in fact say in your question, uh, Saved by the Bell characters, which is just not what the show is called. So I'm questioning your your authority on the entire understanding uh, of of uh, of Saved by the Bell and and the mythology here. Uh, but uh, to the to the larger question, Hank, which I think is probably at the center of things, not. Um 
I don't think that, uh, as, as I understand it anyway, our podcast isn't a uh, rehash of uh, all 17 seasons of Saved by the Bell, uh, but is instead uh, a place where our listeners come for extraordinarily dubious advice. Let me submit uh, that you cannot actually uh, separate who you are from how uh, people see you because identity is something that is hashed out in social spaces. So uh, you are both who you believe yourself to be and uh, what others believe you to be. Um, and I don't think that you can, in the end, really separate those things because I think that identity and personhood are things that we kind of confer upon each other. I, I agree. I also think there's a possibility that your friends do see you as a screech, more of a screech, but they just don't want to let you know that because screech is screech, you know? Maybe maybe they're, maybe they're trying to be, be like, yeah, you're more, yeah, you're, you're like Lisa. It's, uh, you know, fashionable and cool. I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong with being a screech. Uh, no, I absolutely agree. Obviously, Nikki doesn't either, but maybe her friends maybe, see it differently. Maybe they see it as a kind of insult to be a screech. I, I wouldn't want, I have to say, want to associate myself too closely with the actor who played screech. Uh, but as for... Sc- or, honestly, the actress who played Lisa Turtle. Uh, I'm not very familiar with her work outside of uh, Saved by the Bell, but... Uh, but as for the characters themselves, I think like one of the things that makes Saved by the Bell so special as a TV show is that, uh, you know, in its sort of broad stroked uh, way of approaching the American high school, it gave us, uh, who, those of us who weren't yet in high school, like a framework through which to think of our own uh, high school experience once we were there. And I think that's in the end, like what's so valuable about all of those shows. Um, and it's why there's such a responsibility uh, to kind of create those archetypes uh, in ways that will resonate with people. It's not so much that you need to create the archetype for the student who's already in high school. You need to create the archetypes uh, thoughtfully and carefully for the students who will later use them in analyzing their own high school experience. Indeed. That's, I think that was insightful, John. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate that. Let's move on to another question, Hank. This one's from Frida, who writes, Dear John and Hank, can birds fly in space? Well, Frida, can anything not fly in space? I would argue, Hank, that birds cannot fly in space on account of how once they are in space, they are dead. So let's just assume that there's a bird that has a little space suit on its face. And it's flying around, and it's good. It's good. Some sure. some way of uh, it making sure it, it making it able to breathe and stuff. Uh, a bird could uh, would would uh, flap around as if it were flying in space. It would not be able to control itself in space because there's no air molecules to push against. Uh, there's a relative vacuum out there. So so birds fly by pushing against all the molecules in the, the fluid of the air. They would not be able to fly in space. Though recently I was watching uh, The Expanse, which is a very good show that is on sci-fi uh, network. And uh, and they, uh, one of the, a lot of the uh, show takes place on series which has a very low gravity and they have birds there and they do fly they just fly very differently and they flap their wings far less than they would have to here on earth uh, that sounds like a great show uh it's pretty cool not exactly my kind of television program and i only have time to watch about one tv show every four months so unless you highly highly recommend it I don't think I'm going to get into it. Well, if you're going to pick one, I think I would pick The Magicians uh, as a new one, which uh, was written by a friend of yours, I believe, or the book was written by a friend I do, of yours. Uh, I do like the author of that book, Lev Grossman, very much. Yes. Um, I Right now I'm watching Jessica Jones, mm-hmm. which is giving me terrible dreams. Yep. And I'm going to finish watching that, and then I might give up on TV until The Americans returns, uh, oh. just to take a break from television in advance of my excitement about the returning Americans. Well, I am also all caught up on Americans, so I, I'm also looking forward to that. All right, Hank, we've got another question. This one comes from Dylan, who asks, Dear John and Frank, I am Dylan. Mm. I'm six years old in February. I like listening to the show with my mom and dad. I have a question about lava combined with the sun. If you could get lava to the sun, what would happen to it? Best wishes, Dylan. First off, Dylan, let me just say that (laughs) as a parent of a six-year-old, I am very impressed with your podcast listening habits. My own son refuses to listen to this podcast, so thank you. Uh, Additionally, hello, Dylan. My name is Hank. Uh, Frank's fine, though. You could—that's fine. I prefer—I prefer if you call him Frank, Dylan. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, if you if you could get lava to the sun, uh, it would pr- it would probably uh, get even hotter than it already is. So lava is hot, but the sun is hotter, especially on the inside. Uh, so that lava would uh, would get so hot that it would go from what it is now, which has, is is a rock that got so hot that it turned to a liquid. And then uh, when a liquid gets even hotter, like when you boil water, that liquid turns into a gas. So that uh, that rock would go from from liquid as lava, and then it would turn from from if you can believe this, from lava into rock gas. So that is what uh, that is that is part of what at least would happen if you brought lava to the sun. Wow, rock gas would be a pretty good name for a rock band. Yeah, no, uh, actually, uh, have you ever heard of Lepetamine? No. Lepetamine was a performer um, who would play music with his butt. Uh, he was able to uh, do a thing uh, uh, that would al- that allowed him to take air into his body Bottom. and then yep. uh, and then expel it. Uh, and he was able to play music uh, with with farts. And that that, my friend, is another form of rock gas. <laughs> I'm sure Dylan's parents are delighted, just delighted <laughs> that we have shared that with the world. <laughs> All right. I have another question, John. Do you want to hear it? Yes. This one's from Camilla, who asks, Dear Hank and John, after blowing one's nose, as we all do, why does one look into the Kleenex to see what's there? Am I expecting to see something unusual there? Just wondering. Well, I, I, I can answer that question for myself. Um, I am expecting to see something unusual there. I'm checking to see what kind of snot did I produce. Uh, you know... Is there blood in there? Is it clear? Is it colored? Is <laughs> yeah. it green? Is it yellow? Yeah. Is it brownish? Did you get any like real good hunks of something? Are there reasons for concern? Is there evidence <laughs> of my forthcoming death inside that tissue? Uh, there's a famous line in John Keats's. Uh, Oh my God! Are you seriously quoting Keats' diary uh, in, uh, in response to a question about snot it's a right now? Beautiful line of iambic pentameter. He uh, he coughs, and I, as as I recall, you can actually see the drop of blood in the uh, on the page. Like he coughed, blood came out, um, and this was his first evidence that he had tuberculosis. And he wrote, "This drop of blood spells my death," or "This drop of blood it spells my death," because he was trying to write iambically. Um, yeah, so uh, I think we're all just—I think we're all just John <laughs> Keats, just trying to make sure that we don't have tuberculosis. I think that John's not wrong. Uh, I, I, there, there definitely is diagnosis that you can do with with snot colors. Um, uh, uh, actually, there isn't. Uh, there is no? a growing body of evidence that the um, the the tradition that uh, colored snot is bad news and clear snot is good news is just wrong. Oh. Um, I'm not a doctor, but I am a person who Googles symptoms a lot. Uh, and uh, yeah, so um, I don't think that it is a good way to tell yourself whether you're sick. Obviously, if you're coughing up blood or you have a tremendous amount of blood coming from uh, really anywhere in your body, mm-hmm. then you should see a doctor. Yes. Uh, honestly, if you have any questions about your health, probably don't come to comedy podcasts. Probably go to your doctor. Yep, yep. Yep, 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 yep. Though John apparently has a great deal of knowledge about uh, about just illness in general and also what the colors of your snot means, which is apparently not much. So don't worry about it. But I'm do- really working hard on not uh, not being so obsessive around uh, my physical health, but uh, it's just not, it's not easy for me. It is a great source of uh, rumination and uh obsessive thinking spirals so why don't we just move on hank well, i just know i want to say one more thing to camilla's question i want to say one more thing john maybe two more things the first thing is i think that i look at my snot because i want to be impressed i want to look down and be like <laughs> look what i do oh my goodness whoa really yeah look at me Catherine. check this out no i don't do that last oh. part uh, but I oh, think that there's God. a part of me that actually like it wants to know. It wants to like see like how what a massive thing just exited my body. Uh, and second to Camilla's question, I want to say, oh my God, it's burning! Because <laughs> I feel like we haven't done that enough lately. So That's if you true. got something in the in the oven, 
Yeah. Or if you might have forgotten to do something, anything, if you're waiting at the airport and you haven't gotten on your plane yet and you're just listening to this podcast and you're hearing about this snot stuff and you just, yeah. you got to remember, you're still in the real world. It's time to board your plane. Time Get continues plane. to pass. The world is out there waiting for you. But we are moving on to another question because I am tired of talking about snot. Uh, this question is from Nathan. And it's the kind of like deep, penetrating and complicated question that we love to sink our teeth into, Hank. Dear John and Hank, coconuts have hair and produce milk. Are they mammals? Oh, well, you know, yeah. Should should vegans stop eating them? No, no, they are not mammals. Vegans are welcome to eat all the coconuts they want because uh, coconuts do not produce live young. <laughs> <laughs> but don't they, John? Nope, they don't. Uh, I guess they do not give birth to live young. That's right. That's right. Coconuts okay. do not give birth to live young. So uh, vegans rejoice. Coconut milk is back on the menu. Uh, additionally, John, there is a uh, there is another important uh, important uh, characteristic of mammals, which is the three inner ear bones. What? Uh, and coconuts also do not have ears those three inner ear bones well is that true that all mammals have three inner ear bones yeah it's uh weirdly enough it is one of the 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 defining characteristics of mammals is uh are are the ways that our inner ear works i do not know why weird i'm pretty sure yeah pretty sure that i'm not making this up yeah well i mean do people come here for like solid factual science or do they come here to find out about uh you know the fact that there was once a musician who used uh their farts to make music <laughs> uh i looked it up john it says mammals this website here which seems like a legitimate place it says mammals possess many unique skeletal structures including a single lower jawbone that joins to the skull at the squamous bone and three bones in the inner ear so i didn't make that up i'm so proud of myself all right so Long story short, in a stunning turn of events, <laughs> coconuts are not mammals. Yeah, and also, uh, we're the only ones who get those three inner ear bones, so the whole rest of the animal kingdom can just go eat a coconut. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I think, Hank, about the fact that if there is life on Mars, uh, not to indulge your silly fascination with Mars, but sometimes I think about the fact that if there is life on Mars, uh, and it, and it, it did evolve separately... Um, you know, then we could really, we could really learn pretty deep stuff about, for instance, you know, is DNA something or RNA, uh, something that can happen, uh, independently, uh, on more than one planet, or is there a whole different building block of life that we don't even have the capacity to imagine? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a thing. That's a thing that takes a lot of thinking to think about. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It kind of blows my mind. Anytime I try to think about uh, alien life or even just uh, habitable planets outside of Earth, it starts to blow your mind pretty quickly because you look around the galaxy and you have to start to contemplate just how big the galaxy really is. Uh, I think we've talked on the podcast before about the fact that there are probably more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. Yeah, I think the, the statistic is grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. I think it would be the safest one. Okay, well, that's a little... Yeah, that, that, that still is uh, troubling to my yes. ability to imagine the universe. <laughs> like... Uh, I, you know, like our our sun seems like a pretty big deal to be one grain of sand on all the beaches on all of Earth. Yes, yes, and and uh, as far as chemistry goes, we've we've actually I think talked here on Dear Hank and John before about why water is such a great uh, great you know solvent for the creation of complex chemicals and and uh, and life um, right and. Uh, but but that does not mean that life could not happen some other way, which is very difficult to think about, like at different pressures, at different temperatures. If you have liquid methane oceans like they do in some places in our solar system and like what does that mean and how could right. like like what could dissolve in that? What kind of chemistry can happen inside of liquid methane at very low temperatures? And that's uh yeah, welcome to welcome to 
uh, the peculiarity of the universe and 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 the f- the way the ways and and even the fact that life works on America on America on Earth, all of Earth is America on our own Earth is really remarkable and uh, and it is it's a good like the more I know about it the more sort of uh, wonderful it is the more wonder I experience observing it. I have to uh, I have to just uh, jump on that Freudian slip you just made, Hank, because I think it's a very interesting one. Uh, <laughs> the fact that you called you referred to the Earth as America, um, I just think that's interesting <laughs> because we're constantly, in, you and I both, and also most Americans uh, are constantly referring to the United States as America, when in fact yeah. <laughs> America is two continents of which the United States is a small part. Yes, a small part of one. Yes. Yes, uh, well, as as you may have heard, America, dang it. Uh, and do we have a lot of the people? Not really, no. but we're America, so yeah. who cares? We don't have a lot of the people. We do have a unique gift for uh, narcissism and, and for viewing <laughs> our uh, particular slice of America as being uh, in some ways... Uh, you know, unique and exceptional. Yes. Well, you know, um, you, the United States of America does not have the most people, but I bet you, John, that it does have the most corn dogs. <laughs> and that's also, right. I bet the most podcasts. Okay, Hank, let's move on to another question since that's uh, what this podcast is ostensibly about. This one is from Kelsey, who writes Dear John and Hank, My mom and I are going to visit her childhood best friend this summer. It all sounded great until my mom told me that her friend is a minister and that she's going to baptize me while we're there. For one reason or another, my parents never found time to baptize me when I was a baby. And now that I'm 20, I'm not sure that I even want to be baptized. I know that John would say I should use my words and tell her about my uncertainty. But when I tried to explain that I might not even believe in God, she essentially told me that I didn't know what I was talking about and that getting baptized isn't really a choice. Long story short, (laughs) is there any way to avoid hurting my mom while also staying true to what I believe or don't believe. Any advice, even if it's dubious, would be greatly appreciated. Hank and I are going to disagree in our answer, Kelsey. Well, I don't know that I'm even going to be able to come up with one, so you go ahead and go first. All right, here is my answer. Um, Just get baptized. It's not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt anything. You'll be fine. It doesn't matter. That's my solution. And I don't think Hank is going to agree with that at all. Well, I, th- that was as, that was as close as I was going to get to an answer. I, I mean, like, oh, you agree with there's me? There's just get baptized. Yeah, there's just get baptized. But then there's a larger thing. Is it like, is it just get baptized and also just don't tell your mom about the things that you believe ever? No, I don't think that's. Uh, here's, I mean, my argument in favor of uh, of just getting baptized is that it will bring uh, great joy and comfort to. Uh, your family while hurting you very, very little because it's just water. (laughs) Um, I mean, I would make sure that it's clean water. I would ask for it to be maybe bottled water, depending on where you're traveling to. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's like uh, the the ritual only matters if you imbue it with mattering. Uh, So I'm a big believer in, uh, taking the easy road. I, I think I might have told you this story before, but um, when I got married, I had to say, um, have I told you this story before, Hank, that I had to say that I was going to raise my kids in the Catholic Church because Sarah and I got married in Catholic Church? Yes. this is. I've told this on the podcast. I don't think you've told it on the podcast, but you have told me this. Yeah, all right. Well, so I called my dad because I was really upset about it. And my dad... Um, you know, cause I'm, I'm Episcopalian, which is very similar to Catholicism, but whatever, it's different enough that I felt weird about saying I was going to raise my kids Catholic. And, um, I apologize in advance to our hardworking editor, Nick, for the fact that he's going to have to bleep my father's response when I, uh, expressed concern about this <laughs> because dad said, um, well, just say it. Do you think God gives a <laughs> 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 that sounds like dad and i was like i was like what do you mean just say it and he was like just say it just say you'll raise your kids catholic and don't mean it it's fine <laughs> uh, in short kelsey i think there is a kind of uh there is a kind of glory and bravery to refusing to indulge uh other people's uh rituals that matter to other people um 
But I'm not sure that, for me at least, it's the hill that I want to fight and die on when it comes to my relationships, uh, the, the relationships that are most important to me in my in my family. Um, and you know what? Yeah. I ended up baptizing both of my kids Catholic. So there you go. Really? Did Wait. you? Nah, no, I think I baptized them Episcopalian. But like I said, it's almost the same. There's, st- there's a lot similar. of kneeling involved in both. Yeah. Uh, I'll, John just remembers the kneeling. I think that uh, rituals are valuable whether or not you have all of the bits that people tend to go into them with. Uh, you know, like like there is a tradition to baptism that is, I think, greater and I'm, I might catch slack for this, but I think greater than the religious component on its own. So there may be reasons to get baptized that don't even have anything to do with church. Um, and and that I think might even extend beyond just, you know, ha- having a, a more stable relationship with your, with your mom. I, uh, I, I like a lot of religious traditions. I'm not a religious person. Um, I was also baptized and confirmed even. Uh, and, and I was confirmed after I, you know, sort of like came to the place where I'm at with regards to how I feel about religion. Uh, and that was just, you know, it was just part of like the tradition of my my culture. And I am fine with having that tradition, those traditions be a part of my culture, even if I don't have, don't share all of the same beliefs as the people who, who, uh, and like and like experience it in the same way as a religious person would. Yeah, I mean, I do think our our advice on this one is a little bit dubious um, because I think I, sure, especially I, mine. I, I think yeah. there's a there's a definite case to be made that you've got to stand for your principles, uh, especially when they're important to you. I just think that in the case of I, I think you're right, Hank, that in the case of baptism um, and a lot and a lot of other religious traditions, like it's possible to find value in them outside of the. Uh, the religious component. That said, like, I, you know, we both think of baptism very, very differently from the way that um, that some, uh, especially uh, Protestant traditions, think of baptism. Um, and so, you know, I think different people are going to approach it in different ways. And, you know, certainly if, uh, you know, if you only believe in adult baptism and or what is called adult baptism, a lot of times it happens when you're like seven or eight, um, in, in some some churches. But if you only believe in like ostensibly adult baptism and that like baptism is this central moment in your life from which there is no turning back, uh, then I think you have to have a long conversation with your mom. Uh, that's probably going to be an unpleasant one. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I Again, like that's not, that's just not how, like, you know, my kids were both baptized when they were three months old and had n- absolutely no idea what was happening to them. And and they're going to make their own religious uh, decisions, you know, when that time comes. And uh, I hope that, you know, I hope that Sarah and I are able to be part of that. But I don't expect that we're going to be uh, the center of whatever decisions yeah. they make. I think that sometimes it's, it's important to remember that <clears throat> cultural change happens too, too rapidly for some people. And there's and, and like protecting them from that is not necessarily uh a, the kind of lie you need to be ashamed of. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a big fan of I'm a big fan of certain kinds of lies, as you know, Hank. <laughs> uh, I think I think lying is tremendously <laughs> underappreciated by the social order. Uh, I think there are lots of times when, uh, yeah, like I don't know what our mom growing up called little white lies. I love them. I'm a big believer in them. Yeah, I mean, you got to simplify sometimes. Uh, we got we got a, an update here from Kai, uh, who says, "Dear Hank and John." Uh, Kai did the math and determined that uh, indeed um, I did talk more than John did in episode 32. It happened. I talked for 23 minutes and 26 seconds <laughs> while John, including the short poem, spoke for 23 minutes and 14 seconds. So I beat you, John, by <laughs> 13 seconds. <laughs> Oh no! Yeah, no. By three seconds. By three seconds. I'm bad at math. I beat you by three seconds, John. Nope, I did it wrong again. I beat you by twelve seconds, John. <laughs> I kept looking at the wrong number. I did it by twelve seconds. I beat you. 
it won't ever happen again. I'm wondering how long it's going to take you for you. I'm wondering how long it's going to take for you to figure out that I'm not talking in the hopes that all of the uh, dead air time is counted as your time. <laughs> I don't think that's how that works. All right. In an attempt to not talk too much of the air time, I'm going to read the next question very, very quickly, Hank. All right. This question is from Stephanie who writes, Dear John and Hank, would it be weird if I started using the phrase at the turn of the century to refer to the early 2000s? Uh, no, I think that's I think it's about time. No, it's not time yet. It's too soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to happen eventually. No, you know, we just got out of the period where for the long time, people said 2001, 2004, 2012. And we're just entering the period now where people are saying 2015 because people aren't going to say like 2086. They're going to say 2086. Yeah. So we've just mm -hmm. crossed that line. Uh, I think we need a solid five more years. 2021, I think, is the year you can start saying at the turn of the century referring to the turn of the 21st century. You know, I would really like to see when at the turn of the century first started happening for the 1900s. I bet you're right. I bet it's I bet it's further in. I bet it's in, in the, the 20s or 30s. But maybe even later than that, maybe like 50s, 60s, 70s. I don't know. I, I, I think that we got to we got to ask Google. Google knows this stuff. Yes. Yes. No, Google is. Uh, oh, my God. Do you want to know something amazing? What, John? It was 1921. Are you serious? That's according to Google. No way. I'm a genius. I I just I just can't. I just can't. I am a genius. Are you uh, t read me this thing that you have found? Turn of the century from 1921 as an adjectival phrase. That is from etymology online. I mean, there's no reason that that would be wrong. No. Wait, let me go to the Wikipedia page for turn of the century. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to criticize Wikipedia, but this is a terrible, terrible Wikipedia page. The turn of the century Wikipedia page leaves much to be desired if you're looking uh, to expand Wikipedia, by the way. Um, do, 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 yep. Oh, wow. Well, I've got I've got the Google Books Ingram viewer right now. It is actually it's it uh, it takes all books published and it uh, and it mark, marks them by year and when people say the the phrase. Um, and and uh, I can say that indeed it began to appear with some regularity in the twenties, uh, and and then and then oh my God, nineteen twenty one. 2021 is obviously, that's it. That's the obvious answer. If it was first used in 1921, that means that 2021 is when you can begin to use turn of the century to refer to the most recent turn of the century. I am a genius. Uh, Google has confirmed it. I would like to retire from podcasting victorious. <laughs> I'm walking away at the top of my game, Hank. Uh, turn of the century continued to grow until 1980 when it flattened off Great. and then began to decrease in 1994. Mm -hmm. People stopped mm -hmm. using turn of the century. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to see. We're going to have to wait and see if uh, if we see another a dip and then a bump again. My concern is what do we now call the turn of the last century, the turn of the, the 18 to the 19? Well, Hank, it doesn't matter because I've just retired as a podcaster. Uh, victorious, like Michael Jordan, walking out at the top of the game, like Peyton Manning, walking away a Super Bowl winner. I'm going to drink a lot of Budweiser tonight, Hank. Well, I would not expect anything else, question mark. Budweiser, really? Is that the thing that they drink? Did you not uh, Did you not see the Super Bowl? Uh, I can't say that I did. Is that okay? Are you kidding me? Did you? I mean, how do you not participate in one of the fundamentally American social events of the year? Uh, like that? Like the way that I... I can't believe that you didn't watch the Super Bowl. Okay, so in the Super Bowl, which was won by the uh, Denver Broncos... I didn't Broncos, know that. I did, a, I did check horse, to see who was the a winner. A horse-related franchise out of Colorado. Uh, the captain and star player of the Denver Broncos is 72-year-old Peyton Manning. 
uh, who has had like uh, neck fusion surgery 14 mm-hmm, times mm-hmm. and cannot even like bend over to tie his own shoes, but is somehow still the starting quarterback of the Denver Broncos after the game. Uh, when asked whether he was going to retire, he answered by saying, I'm going to talk to my family. I don't think that now is the time for rash decisions. I'm just looking forward to drinking a lot of beer tonight with my teammates. And then he paused and then he looked directly in the camera and said, I'm going to drink a lot of Budweiser. Wow. This is a critical moment in the history of advertising, Hank, because what's most interesting about Peyton Manning's statement, I'm going to drink a lot of Budweiser, is that by all accounts, he was not not paid to say that so he just he, he but he has previously been paid by Budweiser uh, I don't know that he has actually but he does own a portion of a few Anheuser-Busch uh, distributors oh well that's not that's that's different that's different right but that's still that's still marketing what I thought was most interesting about it is that like it's in a way, isn't he, even if he's not being paid to say it, doesn't he know that he will be paid to say it if he says it? You know what I mean? Like, uh, if I had just won the Super Bowl and I said, uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate the help that Diet Dr. Pepper brought to me on this day. Delicious Diet Dr. Pepper, my favorite beverage for my entire adult life. Like, even if I, even if Diet Dr. Pepper wasn't paying me to say that, I know that I could like call Diet Dr. Pepper afterwards and be like, hey, did you see the thing that I did? I, that first one's free. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I bet you enjoyed that. <laughs> and given how much you enjoyed it, why don't you pay me five million dollars to do it again? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, ad- additionally, you could also go up there and say like, uh, uh, you know, I just won the Super Bowl. You know, what I'm going to go do watch Crash Course on YouTube. You want to crash educational videos. And then people would go watch Crash Course. And that would be then that's a right. thing that you own and you would be making the like directly like the the way that Peyton Manning apparently owns some Anheuser-Busch distributors. Uh, what a weird world. Right, exactly. So I just think like we've come to this weird place in advertising where we can't even take people seriously when they say things that they aren't being paid to say because on one level or another, everything that you say when you have a large platform, you're being paid to say or you're at risk of like getting paid in retrospect for saying. <laughs> so it, it's almost like We've destabilized these once trustworthy voices so much that we can't trust them no matter what they're saying, no matter what the motivation is. We can always cast doubt upon that motivation. And it just seems like a really weird time to Mm -hmm, uh, have mm -hmm. a platform. I'm going to go drink a lot. It's funny that he said Budweiser, too. Who says Budweiser? No one says that. I'm going to go have some Buds. I'm going to drink a lot of Buds. I don't know, but you know, it clearly worked because I I found myself immediately saying, you know, it's Sunday night and you can't buy alcohol in Indiana on Sundays because we live in the turn of the previous century. And, uh, but gosh, I wish I could so that I could enjoy some delicious Mm. Budweiser's. I do not ever feel that way. And uh, that's maybe one reason why I didn't want to watch the Super Bowl because I didn't want people to make me feel like I needed that. Because I didn't. Well, but then, Hank, at this point, you can't listen to anybody with a platform saying anything online or off, which means that, you know, from Weird Al Yankovic to They Might Be Giants to whatever other stuff you like, everybody's voice has become compromised. So I don't know. I don't think that you can get out of it just by not uh, watching the Super Bowl. But maybe we should move on to the news from Mars and AFC Wimbledon. Uh, Before we do that, I have another update, John. This one is from everyone on Twitter who has found a four-sided (laughs) banana. Everybody's got four-sided bananas, John. It's really not unusual, and they tend to be trapezoidal. So that's a piece of information we have now. So uh, we think that that a four-sided banana is somewhere on the scale between finding a penny on the sidewalk lucky and four-leaf clover lucky. Uh, It's it's not that common, but it's not that rare. But if you do find a four-sided banana, we're going to go ahead and say that that's a lucky banana. And you should eat it with pride. Congratulations on your lucky trapezoidal bananas, America. And other places. And other places that we're not sure exist or not. You out there other places? Who knows? (laughs) Oh, man. All right, Hank, what's the news from Mars this week? Uh, Well, at the turn of the century, nope, that was not, at the turn of the year, last year, let's just say that, 
Uh, last year, uh, NASA did a uh, did a challenge asking people to uh, to figure out whether or not it was possible to 3D print places to live on the surface of Mars. Because obviously, it is a bad idea to try and bring your house with you when you're going to Mars, because things are very heavy and it's hard to get them through space when you gotta when you gotta speed them up, speed them up and slow them down. Um, so there are a number of companies that entered this this challenge. Uh, one of them was Redworks, and I just uh, I just was sent a link to a video of uh, the sort of concept art for these three D printed Martian habitats, and I was very excited about it. So I just wanted to uh, just wanted to share that. If you want to check it out, um, you can check out three D printed Martian habitats. Pretty cool uh, thing that that NASA did, and it recently announced the uh, the winners for that uh, challenge. So pretty cool, and uh, that yeah. So is the idea that you would bring a printer to Mars and then use like Martian soil to print a habitat? Yeah, yeah. So you'd use like Martian soil combined with, you know, stuff you might draw out of the air or water or, you know, what what have you. To basically, you might be creating bricks. You might be, uh, you might actually be laying down what would sort of be like concrete, but like a, in, you know, like you sort of lay down the concrete in a line, and then you know come back again when it's dried. So it'd be a slow process, but um, but you would be able to build airtight, uh, durable dome things that you could then go live inside of and probably they wouldn't have windows so that's a bit of a bummer but maybe you could figure out how to make some windows from some martian silica and uh and and have those as well though thinking about that i probably would rather given the lack of magnetic field uh, or atmosphere i would rather have a pretty thick slab of something between me and that giant radioactive death star up in the sky Today's podcast is brought to you by that giant radioactive death star up in the sky. That giant radioactive death star up in the sky. Turns out there's as many of them as there are grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. This podcast is brought to you by uh, that giant amount of snot that just exited your body. Wow, that is a lot. Wow, just look at that. Whoa, neat. I really did that. Hey, hey, somebody look. Somebody look. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by the year 1921. The year 1921, confirming my genius since 1921. Uh, <laughs> podcast is finally brought to you by uh, Rock Gas, uh, a new <laughs> genre of music, and also what happens to lava when it gets even hotter. Oh, man. Dylan's parents are just going to be absolutely <laughs> delighted with us for introducing Rock Gas into Dylan's life. Oh, yeah. Well, Hank, yeah. uh, I have exciting news from AFC Wimbledon. Uh, I have sad news. I have happy news. Like life itself, AFC Wimbledon is complicated. It contains multitudes. Uh, first off, uh, the under-18 team's uh, incredible run through the FA Youth Cup has come to an end. Uh, they played Chelsea. Uh, as, I'm, as we're recording this, they played Chelsea yesterday. Uh, they lost. It was 1-1 at halftime. Uh, the dream was alive thanks to a goal from South London's Ginger Messi. Alfie Egan, uh, 17-year-old Alfie Egan, a hero and a scholar uh, and a brilliant, brilliant footballer. But sadly, in the end, uh, AFC Wimbledon's youth team lost to Chelsea. Uh, I mean, Chelsea has one of the strongest youth squads in the world, so not, not a huge surprise. But it was a great, uh, great performance nonetheless and an amazing run through the FA Youth Cup for uh, the young Dons. And then the senior team, Hank, was scheduled to take on, as I'm sure you'll recall, Bristol Rovers in a critical, critical matchup. But then that game in the end was won not by AFC Wimbledon or by Bristol Rovers, but by surprise League Two leaders, Waterlogged Pitch. Ah, Waterlogged Pitch. Waterlogged Pitch has had an incredible year uh, across League Two. He, he's just been dominant. Um, every time you think that, that one team or another is going to win a game, it's won by waterlogged pitch instead. So that game, uh, was, was put off due to waterlogged pitch and, uh, will be played in the glorious future when all things are still possible. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I have a couple of, uh, of updates. I know I've had several updates already, but I just can't help myself. I said last episode that uh, that bacteria 
I, I just was metaphorically sort of whimsically using the phrase cell wall to to indicate uh, some kind of defense bacteria. Uh, defense mechanism for bacteria. Bacteria do in fact have cell walls and I was saying like if only they had cell walls but they do have cell walls and whatever but I just wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page here. I was using that as floral language. In fact it is a technical thing and they do have them. Uh, Secondarily uh, I just want to say John I found a podcast uh, a couple weeks ago that is wait for it it's a, a few brothers three brothers not two but three uh, and they uh, answer people's questions and give them dubious advice. Um, and their podcast has been going on for about five years, and it's really good, and I feel a little like I stole their idea. I promise I didn't. It's called My Brother, My Brother, and Me. It's very funny. It is basically, I mean, it's so much funnier. It's its funny. It's actually funny, which is how you know it's funnier than Dear Hank and John. <laughs> we do set a low bar to jump over. Yeah, they talk almost none about death, uh, which is a little bis- disappointing, uh, but they, uh, they answer questions both from their viewers and from Yahoo Answers. It's very funny. Uh, I've been listening to it at the gym, and I often almost hurt myself because uh, you need to be careful that you never know when they're going to make you laugh way too hard. Um, so My Brother, My Brother and Me is a great podcast on iTunes. We didn't steal their idea, but if you want a comedy podcast with more brothers, yet more brothers, these are the McElroy brothers rather than the Green brothers, giving uh, dubious advice and answering questions. There's another one every single week and uh, it, it yeah, you, you will enjoy it differently. Uh, and I'm not going to say whether you'll enjoy it more. That's for you to decide, listener. Uh, we also want to thank everybody who supports uh, the podcast uh, uh, on Patreon. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. We got to do a uh, one of our monthly hangouts with our patrons last week. It was super fun. So uh, if you want to be part of that or support uh, Dear Hank and John directly, you can do that over at uh, just Google Patreon Dear Hank and John, and it'll take you right there. Hank, what did we learn today? Oh, John, you know, we learned that there's a six-year-old out there who thinks I'm named Frank. It's hard to know if he thinks that you're named Frank or or if his parents do, or indeed if it was perhaps just a typo. But um, I'm going to call you Frank for the rest of your life now. Don't do that. Uh, We We learned that coconuts are not mammals. Uh, We learned that Nikki is, is more of a screech than a Lisa, no matter what her friends say. And, of course, we learned that 1921 was the year oh, God. that turn of the century was first used as an adjectival phrase and that therefore just as i predicted 2021 is the correct year to begin referring to the turn of the new century all right well i'm glad that we have established this reality for the world uh whenever somebody talks about that i'm i'm tasking all of our listeners to to not allow anyone to use the phrase turn of the century in regards to the 19 to 20 switch until 2021 police that with great vigor everywhere you go. Thanks again for listening. Uh, you can send us questions at hankandjohn at gmail.com or via Twitter using the hashtag Dear Hank and John. I'm Hank Green on Twitter. Hank is John Green on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Nicholas Jenkins for editing this podcast. Our theme music is by Gunnarola and as we say in our hometown, don't, don't forget, forget to be awesome. awesome.